is the 5th of November and you're welcome to Midday Brief. My name is Kemini Nyamani Amano. Up ahead, President John Dramani Mahama has requested Parliament to consider a review of the emoluments approved for the executive arm of government. Now in wellness this afternoon, we'll tell you the importance of water and why you need to take it often but cautiously. You'll find out how physically challenged people are getting the help they need in order to acquire employable skills. Election headquarters will do a post-mortem of the Electoral Commission's pilot biometric voting exercise conducted over the weekend. Stay on for details of these stories and many more. In our first story, the Australian High Commissioner William Billy Williams has called for a collaborative effort to help in the disabled in society. He was speaking at the commissioning of a facility for training orthotic and prosthetics technical assistance in Insawam. The centre which trains people in prosthetics also caters for the physically challenged in society by offering them employable skills to offload the burden on their families and government. Derek Wolalom Johnson has more. so much through our own uh, grants program and it's a competitive one too. We've given a couple of million CDs to through various parts of Ghana over the last five or six years. So it's a competitive program. Uh, we will continue to do more where we can, uh, but we can't do everything. Uh, we appreciate the need and the demand. Uh, this is a great platform from which to grow and I think the vision of the OTC for the next 50 years is quite clear. They want to build capacity for Ghana to, to lead in West Africa in this area of disability training. This is where prosthetics are made. Different forms of deformity resulting from either road accidents, chronic diseases or birth deformities. These lads and the elderly are somehow happy they are back on their limbs, though through prosthetic means. They have amazing stories to tell. The boy eating here is all but full of a shocking story. Um, one day we were told by our director, co-director, that there is a boy coming with bent arms. So we were, we were all eager to see that boy. Uh -huh. So the, the, the father brought him. And according to the father, uh, he, was, he got bent by the auntie. The auntie sent this boy to buy some charcoal two years ago. And this boy, I think he, he lost the coin, the money he was going to buy the charcoal with. And when he came, that was what the auntie did to the boy. He put him in a fire. That's the story we heard from the father. So this boy, we were trying to give him some gadgets to help him eat. At first, we were feeding him all right. But this time, when we try to put the gadgets on, he, he refuses. So now this boy is able to eat by himself. Do you believe the story being told by the father? The small boy himself has been saying it all the time. Just because of a coin, his both arms been bent? And even the feet too. In a fortnight, he will be on his way to Germany for surgery. His surgery, Joy Newsland, is being funded by the Dudze Government Hospital and Sunyani Dian Kwanta National Health Insurance Scheme. His supervisor would not want him to talk to us for reasons best known to her. Sister Elizabeth Newman is co-director of the center and she asked that people with disabilities are treated equally, just as we want to be treated by others. Give the physically challenged an opportunity to be employed. Um, I find it very sad when I see so many people begging but I ask myself, what is this person trained to do? They can do a lot, but we have to teach them in a different way than we teach small children. So I, I think I would appeal to all of us to find out all you can about the physically challenged. When groups come here, there's one thing I always tell them. Be very careful that you don't ridicule, that you don't make fun, and that you don't uh, give a chance, because tomorrow or today, you can become physically challenged. 
the orthopedic training center at Nsawam goes beyond just a training center to a university standard. Henry Labby is principal of the College of Prosthetic and Orthotic. I solely put down the curriculum for a three-year course that's, which will lead to diploma in prosthetic and orthotics technology. And it's, it's being reviewed at the Ministry of Health, at the Allied Health Task Force. Before accreditation, too, we, we have to affiliate with the mentor university. So we have to go back to Ken University because at the end of the day, they also have shown interest in using sites as a, as a field site. And we are advised by the registrar of the Ken University that it's two things. Either we collaborate and they make here off campus or we affiliate with them, which was a whole lot of money we have to pay for the affiliation. Let's say you would want to opt for one right now. Yes. Which one would you go for? I'll go for the off campus with Kenya because, you know, Kenya is uh, the, the best university in Ghana and actually the third in, the, in Africa. And so if you are, if you are running a program with Kenya University, you should know. This is the only college in the sub-region that feeds countries with prosthetic and orthotic services including Nigeria, Ivory Coast, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Benin, Burkina Faso, and Niger. Here sits with me the brain behind his center, founded far back 1961, Taseos de Reiter. Yeah, slowly it is coming, huh? Yeah. He finds it difficult to speak due to ill health, but he is content. His vision came to fruition. The center has called on benevolent organizations to come to the aid of the center so they can reach the physically challenged to keep them from being a burden on their families and the nation by giving them pliable skills and also keep them from the streets. Walalom Johnson for Joy News. You're watching the Midday Brief. Now, President John Dramani Mahama has requested Parliament to consider a review of the emoluments approved for the executive arm of government, a statement signed by the secretary to the president, J.K. Bibako Mensa, stated the pres that President Mahama has ordered the Minister of Finance and Economic Planning to withhold authorization for payment of any new emolument for the executive. At a close sitting last Wednesday, lawmakers voted to raise the consolidated monthly pay of the president to about 12,000 Ghana cities, an equivalent of $6,000. The vice president's pay also shot up to almost 10,500 Ghana cities. Now, per last Wednesday's votes, ministers of state and their deputies are to earn between 8,000 and 9,000 Ghana cities. The president order for the review by the legislature under article 7 one of the constitution is to align more realistically with the original recommendations by the professor Irama Adi committee now to join us uh, to further uh, digest this issue is Franklin Kujo executive director of Imani Ghana good afternoon sir and we apologize for having held you on the line for a very long time Good afternoon to, your, to yourself and your listeners. Right, so how does the president's intervention come to you? Well, I, I find it a bit uh, confusing, essentially because at the time the president was sanctioning the salaries for the MPs, don't forget that came in before this one, and that was not too long ago. Um, I suspect he knew that obviously the salary position for himself as vice as well as the executive would be a bit higher. I mean, it was only natural that that was to be expected. So I'm completely at sea as to how this directive has come about. I believe strongly that some time back we were told that the figure that the executive itself proposed was about 15,000 and the Professor uh, Rabna uh, the professor's committee uh, brought it down to the very levels that we have now. And so I'm not too sure I understand what went into this decision, except to say that because of public outcry, I personally don't have any problems with the president and the vice president taking home the figure. I mean, chief executives in other respective companies do take that. Um, but I have a total challenge with the, that of the ministers and deputy ministers because, you see, ma madam, the issue really has to be the productivity. I mean, how many years now since we started having multi-party democracy? Yes, we may have chalked a few successes, but are they really due to the magnanimity or the good works of the ministers and deputy ministers? You and I know that we have too many of them, and we can, this country can do with half of them. So 
I am totally at sea, first of all, how this directive came about, knowing fully that the same executive presidency had approved that of parliament. And parliamentarians cannot end the same as the executive. And so, if now it's a turn of the uh, parliamentarians to approve that of the executive, because that's what the constitutional arrangement is, then I do not see why this uh, decision, except to say that because of public outcry, but it cannot be because of any goodwill. I'm not too sure. And it cannot be because of any decisiveness. I think it is essentially simply before, because people have expressed outcry. And we at Imani have expressed outcry because, one, these salaries, that of the MPs and the ministers and their deputy ministers, are in total disregard to the laws of economics, which obviously means that if your citizens are earning 1,450 Ghana cities per year as a per capita income, why on earth should you be paid 74 and 77 times that figure? It just doesn't make economic sense. So you supposedly pay people based upon the performance of the economy. So that when you are awarding yourself these atrocious sums, you are just telling everybody else that, well, times are so hard, that because you are privileged, you want to end A, B, C, D, and the rest of us can go to hell. That's essentially how this thing comes about. So let's, let's, let, let's probably just forget about all the talk about whether it is right or it's not right. The issue is, does it make economic sense? And I suspect wages, just as it's in the UK, wages are paid, paid, paid based upon the strength of the economy. That's why we have the view that the MPs are earning more, 20 times more than their counterparts in the UK. Because where a UK MP earns about £8,500, that economy can hold it because that economy, the per capita income is closer to what the MP is earning. Here, it is the reverse. So which do we go for? I think these are the matters we need to occupy ourselves with. And to that extent, I think I find the president's position a bit shifty. It looks uh, to me to be uh, a, a rehearsal and dressed, uh, and I'm not too sure it is born out of goodwill. Right. But then again, uh, according to uh, an earlier interview with Professor Irama Adi, or uh, uh, according to um, My Journal 9, now she said the commission used the wage rates of chief directors of the ministries, which according to her was modest relative to other government offices, as the basis, the basis for the new wage for the members of parliament. Is this the way to have done uh, this? Well, again, I think the committee was, uh, I wouldn't say they were misled, but possibly they, were, they, were, they, had, a, they had a basis to use the single spine criteria. But the single spine itself, that's where the problem really is coming from. Because the single spine is a scheme. In fact, it's like a Ponzi scheme. It's a scheme that does not respect the laws of economics, which means that it respects the laws of productivity of labor. All it says is that you may be there asking me these difficult questions and everything else you are doing this afternoon. You should be paid the same as someone else who has a degree, probably like you, right. and is doing some other work, but mm -hmm. not as difficult as yours. You should be paid the same. Now, right. that type of thing occurs in only socialist and communist countries. Mm. It doesn't occur in far forward-looking countries where the labor productivity is, is based upon the price, your, the, right. your price, what you do. So I, I hold brief for Professor Ramadi, but I think that they, they chose the wrong place to look for. But that's a problem, because this single spine team will come back and lash us all and lie and right. make us all lie down. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna have you hold on Franklin for a bit. We have Kletus Avoka, who is majority leader in Parliament. He's joining us in the discussion. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good day. Good day. Right. So, what were the original recommendations made by Professor Rama Adi's committee that the president is now asking us to align it realistically to? I don't understand you. The question. Right now, there's a statement from uh, the Office of the President where he has requested Parliament to consider a review of the emolument approved by the executive arm of government. Now, what the true. President is saying is to align more realistically with the original recommendations by the Professor Irama Adi. Now, what I'm asking is what 
are these recommendations that you're supposed to align realistically to? Uh, well, uh, I'm not the best fellow to answer this question. I think that the office of the president might be in a better position to answer this question. Uh, I, uh, they, they might have gotten some ideas, uh, different ideas as to what should inform us in uh, or the gray areas that we should take into account in arriving at our approval process. I, I can as of now, I'm in my constituency, I'm not among the executives. So I cannot, uh, as of now, determine what the president had in his mind and then uh, before making that statement. What I would expect is that uh, there will be an official communication from the office of the president or the presidency to the Speaker of Parliament indicating the gray areas or the, the area they think that we should revisit and then, and then review. In the absence of that, I cannot, I'll be guessing if I say that uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is an area that the president thinks that we should look at. Now, you, I'm saying so against the backdrop that um, the, the committee's recommendations were in two parts. One, uh, conditions of service, emolument, salaries of members under Article 71 of the Constitution. And secondly, the, the, the conditions of service, etc., of the same people uh, on retirement or when they leave office. Uh, for example, um, if the president... Uh, at the moment, he's entitled to uh, an office, uh, all types of uh, facilities and the rest of them. Now, if he leaves office, he's entitled to different things. It might be one car, uh, and one saloon car, one um, uh, four-wheel drive car, and then the security detail. And uh, he said to, the president was to retire with a state house. That means state had to give the president a card uh, on retirement. But the, the current committee recommended that the president is not entitled to, I mean, a, a house. Uh, when he goes on retirement. So um, um, I do not know. And uh, I think that the best fellow to answer this question will be the presidency as to some of the gray areas that he should do, he should do things that we should revisit. But what I can say now is that he's the chief executive of the country, he's the father of the country, and then if he wants, he makes an appeal to parliament, to the legislature, to uh, review or to revisit what they had done earlier. We are, will be glad to look at it again and then advise us as to whether what we said earlier still stands or their need for us to review. Right. Uh, Franklin, yes, if, if, if you've been listening to uh, the majority leader in Parliament, obviously you know official uh, directive has been given to the Speaker of Parliament to indicate the grey areas. And for that matter, he's not even able to tell me what was in, what really is the original recommendations from the Professor Irama Adi Committee that the President wants them to align the uh, salaries of the executive arm to. Is this good enough explanation? I'm not too sure the Honorable uh, Majority Leader was saying that he doesn't know what the committee, Professor Rara Committee, recommended. I'm not sure he said that. What he's saying is that constitutionally, what, what should happen is that if the executive feels that there have been some uh, miscalculation or miscommunication, the first point of call would be to the parliament. Because it was Parliament, it was the Parliament, that committee that approved their salaries. So now that this has come out, it appears as if the committee's work has been shortchanged. And so he's saying that he's waiting for an official release from the presidency to understand what went into this decision. I think it is fair for of of of, of the honourable to demand that because otherwise. Um, what has been the work really? And as I stated to you, the presidency approves of this. So it's natural that they would have to approve this. And they natural that they would like to increase this a little bit higher. So anything short of that, it's, it's unfortunate. But he can't tell you more, especially because it's not even in Accra. So he may not even have cited other documents. So you, you, you should be fair to him. But the larger issue in all of this is that um, I think the presidency was reacting because uh, there is this huge public outcry mm. that is coming up. And I think the timing also right. makes it a bit unfortunate. Right. But yes. Yes. Let, let, let me just go over to uh, Honorable Cletus Zavoka. Do, yes. do, do you, do you, what really do you make of this whole directive from the president? Well, um, like my very good friend has said, um, the position I have said is that Yes, the president has made observations. 
there should be official communication indicating the areas. Is it the salary? Is it the conditions of service? Is it when they are in office that he thinks that is need review? Is it when they go on retirement and the conditions that they have provided, facilities that they provided for them, that needs review? As of now, I cannot speculate as to the exact areas that the president will want us to revisit. Oh. And that's why I'm saying that the president will communicate officially to us, mm. to the office of the speaker, drawing our attention to A, B, C, D, mm. which means uh, review. In the absence of that, as I stand here as leader of the House, I'll be speculating. If right. I say that the, this so, is what the, the committee recommended, this is what the president has, uh, uh, is talking about, uh, which is not, uh, I don't have that information yet. So this is what I'm saying. But uh, to give you a further background, this committee's report came during the time of late President J. Mills. And then uh, he was looking at it, and then uh, there was an engagement between the executive and the legislature through the chief of staff. Unfortunately, even though we agreed nominally on these areas, these figures and the rest of them, uh, we lost our, 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 our president. And, and therefore, uh, the, the decision to announce these things was stalled until about a month or two months ago mm. that the executive announced that of the legislature. Now, we are also rising, uh, we right. are rising on the 31st of October to mm. go for the campaign and come back after the election. Okay. Now, let me inform you and the public that we have a new law in place, the Presidential Transition Law. And that law um, has the effect of providing regulations and guidelines, etc., as to how a new government can hand over power to an elected government. Mm. We want to forestall what happened between the Rawlings era and Kufo era in 2000, 2001, right. when the handover was full of problems. And also what happened between right. Kufo's handover and that of, uh, to, to that of President, late President Mills. Right. So it is against that background we have passed this law. And this law has provided that before the President hands over on uh, mm. the reins of government to uh, the new incoming government on the 7th right. of January 2013, he okay. might have met, or, I mean, fulfilled the obligation under right. Article 71. That means you have paid off those who are working under Article 71, so it doesn't burden the new administration with arrears of salaries and, right. and, and other facilities. We'll, we'll, we'll probably have to service. continue this conversation later. Unfortunately, for the sake of time, we'll have to end it here. Thank but you. thank you, both thank gentlemen, you very, very much for sharing your time with us on the Midday Brief. You're watching the Midday Brief. I'll be right back. Today, the substance known as water is one of the most essential elements to health and is of importance to the human body as it requires a certain amount to be in place to prevent dehydration and ensure survival. Water makes up more than two-thirds of human body weight. The human brain is made up of 95% water. A mere 2% drop in our body's water supply can trigger signs of dehydration. It is the most important and abundant nutrient in the human system. Water is important to the mechanics of the human body. The body cannot work without it. All the cell and organ functions that make up our entire anatomy and physiology depend on water for their functioning. As a nutrient, water performs other important functions in the body such as digestion and regulates the body temperature. It is normally recommended that about six to eight glasses, at least 150 milligrams each, of variety of fluids or water is taken in a day. However, this will vary with the size and activity level of a person. Children, uh, I will not advise that they take, you give them water whilst they are, they are eating, because they are not old. Their stomach is very small. They have small stomach size. So if they drink water while they are eating, water might fill the tummy and replace food. 
you see, it will take the place of food. So that way they will not take in enough food. So they will not get enough nutrients and energy that is so much needed for their growth and development, you see. But when your child is, uh, you know, children also risk getting choked with food. Uh, especially when it's dry. When the child is chewing bread, for instance, it can easily choke them. Um, they are taking vegetables and all those things. So when your child is getting choked with food, you are free to give them water to wash the food down. So it's not a hard and fixed rule, but in general, it's not too advisable for them to be drinking water while they are eating just so that you can ensure they get enough food, enough nutrients and energy for their growth. It has been proven that being well hydrated make digestion more efficient as water aids enzymes to help in the breakdown of food. Water is also important for fitness and fat loss. For adults, if you are supposed to gain, gain weight, for instance, then I would advise you not to drink water whilst you are eating because you might have to take in enough food and all that so that you can use the energy and the nutrients for building your tissues. But if you are an average adult of normal weight, you can even drink water whilst you are eating. If you are losing weight, you can drink water whilst you are eating. Because the weight loss diet plan in involves um, having to reduce the size of your plate, for instance. Having to reduce the amount of food that you take in, you see. So we reduce the size of food. If the stomach is large and the food is small, you drink water whilst you are eating. Water also fills some, some space so that the little food will satisfy you, you see. Even though drinking water is not time-bound, taking it at certain periods of the day is much better. Yeah, you can take water at any time of the day and yeah I would advise that people um, wash their mouth in the morning before they drink water but looking at it from a dietitian's point of view drinking water early in the morning is just a good way of rehydrating your body you see uh, and it even helps you to take in water which the body needs so much so it gives you nutritional benefits it's a nutrient so you take it in it's okay uh, just make sure that it doesn't replace your breakfast. Water is a nutrient and it is important to drink a good amount of it, especially when one is dehydrated. said for the midday brief but Araba comes in is next with your election headquarters I just love it when technology comes together it's live on radio joy 99.7 FM hello Araba hi Kamini what should we expect in election headquarters today well on today's edition of election headquarters you, as you may be aware mm. the EC conducted a mock voting exercise over the weekend we'll be examining the fallout of that Absolutely. we'll have the EC director of a uh, uh, information and operations so we are not joining us uh, it's, in the it's super important and I and I'm, and I'm hoping that our viewers will join us with your comments on our various social media platforms but then you have all the time certainly so do stay tuned to us here Absolutely. on joy news your election headquarters we'll be right back <laughs> 